um, really scintillating for all the world time. <laughs> um, and I think what is noteworthy about Han, one of the kind of lines of affiliation between him and Kami is the way in which Han is not only a brilliant scholar, but he's really a writer. Um, he's really an esthete and an artist as well as a scholar. And it is our honor to welcome him here today. Much, Tina. I, I wasn't expecting anything more than name rank and serious about this. So I'm be very flattered to, to, to be so, so flatteringly described. Uh, so the, the talk is called Learning to Be a Scholar with Kang Sun Jia. And when I told Tina the title for these remarks, I must not have been thinking in English, because the word scholar may give an inaccurate impression of what I had in mind when I think about what Kang is talking and done for me and what her influence has meant for me over the last 30 years. It's true that I learned a lot in her classes, ways of reading classical Chinese poetry, ways of breaking down the relation between the spoken and the unspoken, ways of mediating between the long-gone Chinese past and our local present. I picked up a lot of bibliography, and I learned how to make an argument that East Asia specialists would read to the end. For all that, I am really grateful, like her many students. But such skills can be imparted by many people. If you know your way around the library, you could even learn them from books. What I wanted to say in that moment of fumbling with language in my email to Tina was that years of acquaintance with Kami made me see the depth of her commitment to a way of life that I wouldn't precisely identify with the scholar if we're thinking in English. Scholars are obsessive, retentive, data-gathering fuss budgets. <laughs> they can be experts, they may be respected, but they can also be oppressively narrow in focus. When I think of Kanye, though, I think of someone who has been through formative experiences with book and brush and typewriter and computer that relate to the accumulation of knowledge, but also been through other experiences to which she has responded by forming the personality that in Chinese we identify with the Wenren, the Shen Shu, or more colloquially, the Du Shu Ren. These terms collectively get closer to what I was thinking, but each of them is misleading in its own way. The Wen Ren is maybe too closely identified with the process of literary creation. The Shen Shu is someone belonging to an elite partly defined by the command of literacy. Du Shu Ren is a normative term, but not a term strongly inflected with status or specialness. That's why I prefer it. Anybody can join the group of the Shuren. It refers to the set of educated people who respond to the bumps, joys, and chances of their lives and regulate their reactions with the consciousness they've acquired from books. They know they're, they're not the first to experience whatever is happening to them. Since we're talking about China, let's recognize that they have easy access to nearly 3,000 years of joys, sorrows, and quandaries expressed on paper. Familiarity with that enormous human archive moderates the human's response to swings and as it does to swings and moderates the as we've been fortunate to have her do right here in HGS for the last 35 years. Connie's benevolence and tolerance have affected me, and I know I'm not the only one in innumerable ways. First of all, she didn't discourage me when I showed up to ask if I could take her class on the Book of Changes in the Adelects in 1984 or 5. I came here, if I may fill you in on the background, with a lot of curiosities and not nearly as much direction as the other graduate students of mine here. I had studied Latin and Greek and Italian, I was addicted to French poetry, I knew a little about linguistics, I was obsessed with memory palaces and imaginary languages, I could recite paragraphs from Devon and Derrida, and I was trying my best to read all the books quoted in Walter Benjamin's unsuccessful 1927 PhD thesis on the origins of German tragic drama. And I know a little Chinese. Worst of all, I thought this gave me license to opinionate about everything connected to any of the above items. At that point, I think I had read from the history of Chinese philosophy 
Francois Chung's book on Tan poetry and James Yeo's The Art of Chinese Poetry, and that was about it, if you don't count childhood memories of Lin Yutang. I knew Chinese literature had to be fascinating, but I couldn't tell you much more about it than that. I also knew that my home department, comparative literature, was racked and rent by discord in the wake of Paul Demont's death. I was looking for people who would give me a space to learn and grow in without too many drawn swords. Although Yale is by and large a friendly and accepting place, I'll concede that I didn't get an enthusiastic reception from all the sages at whose doors I tremulously knocked. Some suggested I had better spend my time elsewhere. One dean tried to get me to leave. Connie let me in her office, listened to me unpack my ignorance for a few minutes, and allowed me to join her seminar, reminding me to do the reading every week. There was a lot of it, or so it felt at that stage when I had to go over every sentence two or three times. She also suggested that I go see Yu Yingshu, whose seminar on song intellectual history I sat in on, another transforming experience that I wouldn't have known where to seek without help. The first thing that struck you about Kanye's seminar was that it was held in her office, a tiny space that she had managed to make feel like a dollhouse's living room. <laughs> I remember that it's always warm, though that may have been due to the archaic heating system <laughs> a particular concern of Kanye's for our cover. There were a couple of sofas wedged into a corner, cushions, pictures, flowers, lots of books, and Kanye sitting in the middle of the group, looking more as if she had invited us for lunch than like someone running a class. The competitive streak that runs deep in the sort of people who sign up for graduate programs at Yale was disarmed. The six or seven of us in the room with her became allies without realizing it. We were there to enjoy an intellectual experience and to make it more enjoyable for each other. As you know, Kanye has the gift of friendship. The people I met in those several years of taking classes with Kanye included, if I may mix students and visitors together, uh, Li Wei Shu, Wang Ailing, Qin Nan Xiu, Charles Kuang, Stephen Snyder, Yang Ze, Tony Yu, Zhang Longxi, and many others. We had vastly divergent pasts, some of us having grown up comfortably over here, others having lived through shocks as deep as the Cultural Revolution. And as we read ancient books together, our sensibilities joined in something like a multi-perspective Chinese scroll, a few feet of which were unrolled every week. These people are often in my mind, though some of them I don't see often enough. But I know the people I've lost touch with will naturally be in contact with our lost shirt. When I got to the stage of writing chapters, I knew I could get speedy and constructive commentary from Kanye. One thing I quickly noticed, Although it seemed to me that in academic argument you wanted to take every opportunity to score points and show how previous scholars had been wrong so that you, by implication, could be right, Kanye <laughs> instinctively drew back from that kind of pushing and shoving. At times, I thought she lacked fire or courage with this unwillingness to offend. After all, doesn't the truth always offend people the first time it comes out? This was, of course, highly silly of me, and Kanye's gentleness was not in the least a political calculation, as I came to realize. She just didn't like the competitive and possessive character traits that academia sometimes brings out. Her own work is exemplarily nonviolent and imaginative conciliatory <laughs> formulations, even when she is dealing with such emotions as the patriotic and then suicidal outrage of Chen Zilong, the envy and resentment that Liu Shi had to face as the concubine and then wife of Qian Qingyi, the indignity and social death that Wu Weiye had to endure, or the constant elbowing that went on between two classic types of Chinese women poets, courtesans and gentry women. These are all facts of the matter, and we can't interpret any literary datum, not even the order of poems in an anthology, without being aware of them. But we shouldn't yield to the temptation to perpetuate them or translate them onto another plane in our scholarship. In this way, Kanye's office was a school of character. In another way, she showed us how to read by making sure that every classical text was accompanied by more than one commentary. I may never understand what the Yijing is about, but thanks to that long ago class, I can see what it made traditional Chinese people argue about and following the development of their opinions may deliver more of a revelation than even that classic work can do. 
As she says in her article, Ming and Qing Anthologies of Women's Poetry, there are ways of inheriting and revising the traditions that are themselves dynamic and creative. Choosing what to put in an anthology, prefacing it, footnoting it, putting it in the company of other works and claiming resemblance, all of these acts keep the tradition from stagnating and are eminently readable themselves. I haven't known many people who could so easily and naturally convey the sense of Chinese literature as a vast conversation among people who are all, in some sense, each other's contemporaries, whatever dynasty they may happen to have been born into. This sensibility, I find, is a helpful armor against the tendency to treat the past as too distant and exotic to concern us. A tendency that the ever greater waiting in the humanities of the nearly present of the recent past, such as we see today, only encourages. Connie's closeness to the authors she reads and writes about is reflected in her judgments on their accomplishments. She reads for evidence of the way that writing intermingles with a self and a situation. Of Tatian, she says, his new lyricism is characterized by both expressive impulse and narrative distance. We find that the narrator says scarcely a word without some kind of explicit characterization of his thoughts and impressions. And yet throughout the poem, the gentleman who is its subject remains silent. Now, this is, she says, a dramatic rhetoric set against the limitations of traditional lyric poetry. I've been quoting from Six Dynasties Poetry, as you probably know. Rarely, I think, has a style been so accurately and so discreetly conveyed. There is also much subtlety of a kind that naive textualist can never attain in her narration of the stylistic evolution of Yu Xin, from a master of the decorative palace style poetry to the inventor during his long northern exile in the of a new style of they can even manage to imitate the earlier palace style verse with a confounding degree of similarity. Uh, she says, the only thing new about Yuxin's descriptive technique in his later years is the extraordinary way in which he mingles the already acquired imagistic sensitivity with a more sophisticated expression. In other words, the same words but different meanings at two ends of his career. It was an education in the ways of poetry and human life to watch Kangi draw such fine observations and distinctions from the lines of characters in front of us. I quote again, Although China seems to value its poetry highly, it's it treats its poets lightly. Another bit of breathtaking understatement from that same book, said in reference to the poet Xie Tiao's untimely death, brought about by an unfounded accusation of his involvement in a friend's secret plot. This, too, has been part of the Du Shuren's experience for millennia, and implicitly infused the reading of lines and phrases in our small seminar. We learn to be alert for signs of defensiveness or toadying. A word in the wrong place, as Su Shi found out, could seriously knock one's biography out of joint. What we did not know, or what only a few of us might have known, was how closely Kangyi's family story might have echoed the fate of Xie Tiao in the 5th century, were it not for some strengths of character and some chance events. One night in 1950, the police broke into the Sun's house in Taipei, handcuffed her father and took him away. Kangyi has written about her childhood in the book Zhou Shu Bai Se Kong Wu, Journey Through the White Terror. About this episode, she notes, Mother said that the day the secret police came to arrest my father, they initially intended to take her too. But as soon as I saw that something was all right, I immediately grabbed a long stick, wielded it fiercely, and headed for the man. They said the man was so moved by the courage and filial loyalty of a six-year-old girl like me that he gave up. Now, if this story had been more widely known, I think no graduate student at Yale would agree to take any other faculty member as advisor. It's almost a wuxia xia A small girl overcoming the secret police with sheer moral power. And yet it happened. One doesn't like to think of the outcome if both parents have been taken away. Even a resourceful and brave six-year-old in a strange city is bound to find the going of the Now, Paul Sun would spend ten years, the central years of Kanye's childhood, as a 
political prisoner. Merely on, merely on suspicion of having associated with people who held anti womandop views. Beaten, tortured, starved, sent to the notorious Green Island concentration camp, and suffering from prison-acquired tuberculosis, Connie's father saw his wife and children only occasionally for a few minutes through a double thickness of plate glass. Connie's mother made ends meet by teaching village wives to sew. She fended off unwanted suitors and wrecked her health with overwork. Relatives, friends, teachers were scared off from this suspicion-clouded family. Some stood by them, but by no means all. In a Kafkaesque turn, the police inspector, charged with following up on the Paul Soon case, would summon little Kangi to his office and require her to report on her schoolwork. When she came out first in her class, or won awards and scholarships, this man, her family's tormentor, or at least the official representative of their torment, would send her a congratulatory note. I strongly suspect that Kangi's ability to recognize double messages must have its source in this kind of profoundly ambivalent experience, where interest and concern cohabitate with the predicament of being a person of interest or of concern to the police. And Kangi's deep scholarly pacifism, her reluctance to throw her weight around, her optimism about others' motives, can perhaps be traced to such influences as the teacher who urged the young girl, I quote now, to learn from Lao Tzu always to be like water, which, despite its lowly view of itself, is nevertheless freely able to open up new spaces by constantly flowing. Later, she says in the same book, when I grew up, I discovered that the reason I was still able to be patient and seek fulfillment in some situations was attributable to Mr. Lan's encouragement, as that teacher's encouragement. He had told me, sometimes for the sake of peace in the world, the world needs someone to act as a garbage can. Over the years, whenever I encountered trouble with people in the world, I always thought of Mr. Lan. I'll quote it from a uh, journey through the White Terror. Thus, in an extraordinary gesture of freedom and of opening up new spaces, Kami prefaces her memoir by saying, this book is not accusation literature, nor is it literature of the wounded. On the contrary, it is a book of gratitude. She ends it by saying that for her family and others affected by the Cold War tyrannies, I quote, our journey together has created a shared art of remembrance. Kangi, you have had some extraordinary teachers in that art. And it is because you were able to receive the art and repel the bitterness that we have had the great good fortune to learn it. Not all of it, but some of it from you. Confucius said about himself, perhaps at a birthday party with his disciples, maybe after telling Yan Wei to eat more of the noodles, that Qi Shi are some xin suo yu, bu yu ju. At 70, I can follow the desires of my heart without overstepping the bounds. Kami, may you long follow the desires of your heart. So it seems for you. No one, know, no one who knows me has the slightest worry that you will overstep the bounds. <laughs>
And in the second half of this afternoon's um, events, we are honored to welcome another of Kung Lee's distinguished students, Wang Ao, who is uh, an assistant professor at Wesleyan University, as well as a distinguished poet. And I think that all of us who know Kang Lee know that in addition to a rich um, scholarly life, she also has a life of being a bellatristic writer in Chinese, um, somebody who contributes to the world of letters in many ways. And one of the things that I found so moving about Han's little speech just now was the way in which Han Yi, Kang Yi has been not just a teacher in Chinese literature, but a teacher in character for so many of us. And um, and I think a, a teacher in the many ways in which we can contribute to the world around us. And with that, I'd like to introduce Wang Ao, who will first be reading his poetry in Chinese, and then uh, Jesse Green will be reading the translation in English. I was just uh, read a poem I uh, composed the last year. This uh, poem is uh, actually it's not about, about student and teachers, rather it's about friendship. Um, it's true that I I never call Professor Chang Kami because I want to fully respect him. <laughs> <laughs> My people are always like dear Professor Chang, C H A N G rather than. Professor Sun or Kang Li, because I want to use the very traditional Chinese way and authentic Chinese way. So uh, I think in a Chinese tradition, teachers are also friends, ultimately, in the long term. So I don't know that sometimes one day I can say that we have friendship, and I really appreciate that. So this poem is actually written uh, about a mutual friend. Come, uh, Professor Chang and, and I have a mutual friend whose name is Edward Edward Rod, and uh, he is an expert on the American poet Wallace Stevens. Uh, he is a very interesting person, actually. He got uh, his PhD from University University of Cambridge, and then he went to Beijing. Now he's teaching English literature at Tsinghua University, and he does not speak Chinese, so he's a lonely poet working on the Tsinghua campus. He sent me an email last year in September. And uh, in October, he found me on Facebook. So we have a... <laughs> <laughs> he asked me, do you receive my email? I said, what? I said, uh, 45 days ago, I sent you an email. That's one month and a half. I said, I, I, I don't remember anything about that. So this poem is about what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then I sent this poem to Professor Chang and she said, I like it. <laughs> I decided, because we prepared for a long time, Tina told me that this is a secret. <laughs> so I tested it. Professor Chang said, she likes it. I said, OK, let me read this poem. The uh, title is, What's on the way? <笑>一个半月前 在白天，他们让我入睡，晚上我会关掉。心里说，他觉得作为同龄人，年龄已经是个问题。我说有同感，我曾在梦中搬家，醒来有种毫无必要的疲劳。心里说。这首诗虽已发表过，但还想修改一个词。他说，一个词关乎胜利，另一个暗示离别。我提议，离别早已注定，有可能的只有胜利。
他说就用他了，是真的什么都做不了吗？这样认为的人，我觉得有两类，一类就是奥登本人，另一类是不写诗的人。你收到我的信了吗？你也问过，白居易放走了飞燕，去了哪里？你最近给我写信了吗？我查一下。短期记忆里的山月万重，短期记忆也是个信号，我们都同意，它像一个迟到的比喻，在某辆乡村运输车上，颠簸着惊奇与波动的美。到达的时候，他帮我忘了自己。我们回头见，谢谢。Translated by Eleanor Goodman, and it's titled "Trunk I Not Yet Read to Read." More than a month ago, Edward sent me a long letter. Nowadays, he said he's working in Shanghai, helping take care of a fat cat. In a while, going to teach a wine class. Here at home, the mingled sounds of crickets and waves float through an app. They help me sleep during the day. And at night, I turn them off. The letter said he feels that to be contemporary, age is already an issue. I said I feel the same way. In dreams, I'm often moving to a new house, and I wake up unreasonably fatigued. The letter said, although this poem's been published, there's a word that maybe should be changed. He said one concerns victory. One suggests separation. I propose that separation is destined, and only victory is still a possibility. He said he'll just use that. But does poetry really make nothing happen? Of those who think that way, I believe there are two types. There is Auden, and there's people who don't write poetry. Did you get my letter? And you also asked that wild goose by Drury released. Where did it go? Did you write me a letter recently? I searched for it through the towering mountain folds of my short-term memory. Short-term memory is also a signal. We all agree. It's like a late arriving metaphor. A pig truck in the countryside. On which wonder and rippling beauty jolt about, and when it arrives, it helps me forget myself. We'll see each other soon. Thank you.